Seeing none, it's now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. According to Innovative Research Group poll results that were highlighted in the National Post, the people of Ontario have never been so angry. And why, Mr. Speaker, are they angry? Maybe it's because this government has lost $6 billion giving energy away to places like New York, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. Maybe it's because, according to the Auditor General, between 2006 and 2014, Order, the people of Ontario have been overcharged $37 billion for electricity wow. and global adjustment fees. Maybe it's because this government has overpaid $9.2 billion for renewable contracts while the Liberal Party took $1.3 million in donations from 30 companies. There's a lot of reasons why the people of Ontario would be angry, but Mr. Speaker, I want to ask the Premier, why do you think the people of Ontario are so angry at your energy policy? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, let me once again uh, talk about what has happened in uh, in this province on uh, electricity generation, Mr. Speaker. Um, we inherited an electricity system that was badly degraded, Mr. Speaker. It was dirty. The grid was dirty, Mr. Speaker. We were plagued with brownouts and blackouts and smog. That's not helpful. Well, if the both of you want to keep going, we'll go to warnings. Premier. We took that dirty, unreliable system, Mr. Speaker, and we cleaned it, Mr. Speaker. We invested in it. We now have, we now have an electricity grid that is 90 per cent renewable, Mr. Speaker. The shutting down of the coal-fired plants in this province the investment in a renewable industry, Mr. Speaker, was the was the Answer. single largest initiative in terms of reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in North America. We're proud of that, Mr. Speaker. We've done away with smog days. We've reduced that pollution. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. Last night, CTV's Paul Bliss broke a shocking story. Hydro One has been collecting money specifically to pay for equipment they deem very high risk for failure. But Paul Bliss learned that there are still 111 transformers that are in dire need of repair, so much for the Premier's talking points on reliability. For years, this government has been approving rate increases, then failing to fix transformers. They're not bringing reliability to our system. So my question is, what did that money go for? It was supposed to be for repairs. Was it used to pay the $4 million salary you approved for the CEO? Was it, tw was it the $24 million the Premier approved for the new executive members? Because it certainly wasn't going to fix the transformers. So, Mr. Speaker, question? why has the Premier allowed Hydro One to raise rates but not fix the system. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know I know that the Minister of Energy is going to want to speak uh, in the final supplementary, but Mr. Speaker, let me just say, and we have visitors here from California and from Quebec, with whom we are partnering, Mr. Speaker. We are partnering to continue to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And so I think it is instructive for our visitors and our partners to hear to hear the rhetoric from the other side mr speaker from people so who don't who don't support the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions who don't support the changes that have made to make our grid a clean electricity grid to do away with smog days mr speaker to reduce pollution in the air they don't support that mr speaker but the reality is we are steadfast we are going to continue to invest in our electricity Answer. system. We are going to continue to re reduce greenhouse gas emissions and work with enlightened jurisdictions like Quebec yeah. and California. Yeah. You see it, please? You see it, please? We're edging towards warnings, number one. Number two, always speak to the chair. And audiences are not allowed to participate in the House business. New question, Leader of the Opposition. Oh, sorry, sorry, final supplement. 
Mr. Speaker, uh, back to the Premier. I can understand why the why the Premier would reference Quebec being here today, but they should be here thanking Ontario because this Premier has been giving away Ontario electricity, sometimes even paying Quebec to take it because of the contracts that this Premier signed in return for Liberal Party donations. So, Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. You know, I received an email. I, uh I, I'm ready to admonish one side and the other side follows along. It's not easy for me, so I will probably just decide to move to warnings. So we are now in warnings, and I'll be fast with them. Please finish. Mr. Speaker, what do these reckless energy policies mean for people? I re received an email to my Simcoe North constituency office from Mary. She is a member of the Canadian Forces and a single parent of two children. She sacrificed a lot to serve her country, but because of this government's hydro policies, she now has to choose which bill she won't pay each month so she can, he she can keep the lights on. She has cancelled her cable and phone and all of her kids' Question. extracurriculars. Mr. Speaker, she is now saying she has to leave Ontario. She's asking for a different posting. My question to the Premier is, why are you doing this? Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, I just want to say that we understand that there are people in the province who are, uh, who are having trouble paying their electricity bills. We understand that, Mr. Speaker, which is exactly why, in the throne speech, we introduced uh, an initiative that will uh, take the uh, uh, provincial portion of the HST off people's electricity bills for rural communities, Mr. Speaker, another 12 percent reduction, up to 20 percent reduction on their bills, Mr. Speaker, and expand the uh, Industrial Conservation Initiative to help businesses to deal with their electricity bills. We understand that, Mr. Speaker. We know that people need support, which is why we have a range of programs in place. But, Mr. Speaker, the investments that we have made in our electricity system to make it clean, to, redu to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, you know, the, the opposition said there have, we haven't made investments. We most right. certainly have made investments, sure Mr. Have. Speaker. Right. Over 10,000 kilometers of line. So, up. Mr. Speaker, we've made those investments, and I sit. <laughs> yes. The member from Leeds Granville is warned, and I've got three others in my head. The next time they speak, they'll be warned. Carry on. I sit at a table with premiers from across the country, and I know that it is in the best interest of the people of Ontario that we work with Quebec, that we work with Manitoba, that we sign agreements and we find ways to share power, Mr. Speaker, which is exactly what we're doing to an unprecedented level, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation is warned. Anyone else care to say something? New question, Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Yesterday, the Minister of Energy defended the Ontario, the Ontario Energy Board's decision to bury the cost of cap and trade plan on people's bills. The Liberals have no problem showing their Band-Aid rebate solution as a line I, I Excuse me, stop the clock. No, sorry, sorry, just keep the clock going. A member from Hamilton Mountain is warned. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, why shouldn't cap and trade be a line item on the natural gas bills? After all, isn't this government supposed to be in favour of being open and transparent? Mr. Speaker, directly to the Premier, why is the Premier afraid to show the true cost of cap and trade plan? What is she hiding? Why would she not allow it in the bill? It's inconsistent with what she's doing on the rebate. Yes or no, will you Question. have it on the bill? Will you be transparent? Minister of Energy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to uh, thank the uh, member of the official opposition for the question, um, because it's, uh, it's an important one for me to continue to reiterate. We're not comparing apples to apples in that question, Mr. Speaker. We've been very transparent all along about what the cost is going to be to cap and trade, but making sure that we didn't act on or not acting on cap and trade and not acting on climate change, Mr. Speaker, would cost so much more. The OEB is a quasi-judicial organization that makes its decision, Mr. Speaker, and we respect that. 
that decision. They base this basically, Mr. Speaker, as saying this is a cost of doing business. We don't see the cost of the, the pipes on the bills, Mr. Speaker. We don't see the cost of labours on the bill, Mr. Speaker. So they made the decision. They did consultations with many, many organizations and with stakeholders right across the province, Mr. Speaker. This is the decision that Answer. they came up with, and this is the decision that we respect. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. By not putting the cost of cap and trade on the bill, Liberals are throwing the natural gas companies under the bus. It will look like the companies are raising prices when, in fact, it's the Liberals' cap and trade scheme that will force prices up. Why would they want to do that? Well, maybe it's because the Premier is hosting a $1,000 dinner next week at Menergy, a Chinese energy company that wants to replace natural gas. The previous Liberal cabinet plan to ban natural gas was exposed by Adrian Morrow in the Global Mail, forcing the Liberals to retreat. Not to mention they are still mandating net zero homes, another way of forcing people off natural gas. Mr. Speaker, is, the Liberals, is this the Liberal secret agenda trying to force people off natural gas? When will their attacks on affordable home heating end? Mr. Speaker, absolutely no one is trying to force anyone off natural gas. We're actually expanding natural gas. I guess they can't hear it. The only thing that that this group is trying to do is put people back on puffers, Mr. Speaker. We eliminated all coal-fired generation, Mr. Speaker. We've invested in our system, our natural gas system, $200 million loan programs to get more communities and more municipalities and First Nations onto natural gas. $30 million grant program, Mr. Speaker, that is being uh, looked after for by the great Minister of Infrastructure. We look forward to having the conversation and getting more of our communities on natural gas to give those choice, Mr. Speaker, to give that choice to as many families and communities right across our great province, Mr. Speaker. You see it, please? You see it, please? Before, before we move forward, uh, people that are sitting in different seats, uh, I still know who you are, I still know what riding you are, and you're actually getting closer to me, which means I hear you even more. Just saying. Just saying. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. I can understand why the Premier wouldn't want to answer these questions. Her government's energy policy is an unmitigated disaster. But, but I hope the Premier will answer this question. A few months ago, CTV's Paul Bliss exposed the tax on a tax. Just another thing the Liberals tried to hide. So let's recap. The Liberals tried to ban natural gas. They are burying the cost of cap and trade on natural gas bills. And the Liberals tried to hide the tax on a tax until Paul Bliss exposed it. Mr. Speaker, how far will this government go to hide their true plan to rid the province of natural gas and affordable home heating? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Minister of Environment. To the environment. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, let's press the pause button because the Leader of the Opposition has a plan to raise carbon prices between $110 and $150 a tonne with zero revenues to help people adjust to it. That means that rates would be seven times higher. But maybe he's flip-flopped again like he did on wow. sex ed and climate change and choice and so many other things, Mr. Speaker, because he's got more positions and he's got members on his side, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? No question. Member from Bramley Gore Moulton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. My question is to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, the Premier doesn't want to talk about the privatization of local hydro utilities. She says it's up to the municipalities. 
But that's not the whole story. The <coughs> Minister of Economic Development and Growth is warned. Finish your question, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. But that's not the whole story. The Liberals can encourage the privatization by offering special tax loopholes. The government has a choice. Is the Premier going to encourage the Toronto Hydro's decision or the privatization of Toronto Hydro by creating a tax loophole? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I have uh, I have answered this question. I've said, and it remains the case that it is up to the City of Toronto Council and the, the Mayor to have this discussion and to make a decision about uh, about their utility. It, it is up to them. And if the member opposite is interested in that discussion, he should talk to uh, to the members of Council at, at Toronto at well, City of Toronto. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the facts are, are very different from what the, the Premier is putting forward. The reality is the Premier can make it a lot easier for Toronto Hydro and other u local utilities to privatize if she gives the municipalities a tax break. That means the Premier won't be sitting back and waiting for the municipalities to make the decision. That means the Liberal government will have a direct role in the privatization of local hydro utilities. And the media are reporting that the Premier has said, quote, she will not stand. I will not stand in the way of any push by Mayor John Tory to privatize Toronto Hydro. Is the Premier going to make it easier for local hydro utilities to privatize by providing a tax break? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as the Premier said, the decision to privatize uh, Toronto Hydro is up to Toronto City Council. That is, there's no ifs, ands, or buts out, Mr. Speaker. That is the um, council that makes the decision. Um, what I'm uh, thinking that the uh, third party is confusing uh, is privatization and consolidation. We have 70, over 70 LDCs, so we have over 70 utilities right across the province, Mr. Speaker, and we would like to see that, uh, that number come down. So we put forward voluntary consolidation to actually have these companies come together to find savings. The electri elect uh, independent electricity system operator has said that there will be about a billion dollars in savings, Mr. Speaker, for the ratepayers. About a billion dollars in savings for the ratepayers if we have some of this consolidation. So I think, Mr. Speaker, that the third party is confusing privatization and consolidation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Final supplement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, absolutely not. There's no confusion here. In fact, I agree that the city and municipalities have the decision. But if the city of Toronto, for example, were to sell Toronto Hydro, they would have to pay $200 million in taxes to the provincial government in a transfer tax fee. So the Liberal government can actually encourage this decision if they waive that tax. Liberal insiders say the Premier is interested in waiving this provincial transfer tax and encourage the privatization so that privatizing hydro, uh, Toronto Hydro could give the Liberals, quote, political cover for their own privatization of Hydro One, end quote. So my question is very simple. Will the Premier help the privatization of local hydro utilities by waiving the Question. provincial taxes, yes or no? Thank you. Minister, Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the member opposite has it all wrong because, in fact, when we were looking at Hydro One and our ability to broaden its ownership, it did, in fact, incur a degree of deferred tax, which we benefited from as people of Ontario to the effect of, again, enabling us greater value to the Trillium Trust, which is now going to be used directly into infrastructure. But the member opposite, in fact, has his own utility, which is under question now, which is going to benefit from a consolidation because of the benefits that we provided for some tax relief with Brampton Hydro, Enersource, Horizon, and PowerStream, all by the consolidation to create great efficiencies for that member's constituents, which he apparently opposes as well, Mr. Speaker. And that's unfortunate because this member's and his constituents will benefit from some of these initiatives and, again, will be able to Answer. invest even more into the infrastructure. Ultimately. The people of Toronto, the Council of Toronto, it's their Thank decision you. to make, Mr. Speaker. New question, the member from Donnelly, John Malkin. Mr. Speaker, my question again, Mr. Premier, and let's make it clear: no one in this province benefited from the privatization of Toronto Hydro, but for the Liberal Party and their elite friends. People across Ontario are concerned about how they're going to keep the lights on, how they're going to warm their house this winter. 
Privatization doesn't mean that hydro agencies will have different owners, as the Liberals like to claim. It means that prices will go up, costs will go up. As one investor told media, if Toronto Hydro is privatized, the new owners will, quote, expect a return on their investment. And the obvious way is to further rate increases for the Toronto Hydro's 730 customers, 730,000 customers, end quote. It's very clear that privatization increases costs. The question is, will the Premier rule out any further privatization of our hydro system? Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise and, and answer the question for the honourable member. Um, as he well knows, the OEB is the uh, organization. It's a quasi-judicial organization that's not part of the government. They set the rates, Mr. Speaker. Um, the broadening of uh, Hydro One has actually helped our government, uh, you know, continue to invest in, in infrastructure right across the province. And it's not just us that's saying that, Mr. Speaker. There's a great uh, report today in the Globe and Mail from uh, reporter uh, Tim Kaladzi that talks about the Hydro One sale is uh, uh, a home run. He points out that when the PCs were in power, they privatized the 407 at a cut rate price. As he says, luckily, quote, the Premier wisely listened to her advisors and decided to sell 60 per cent of Hydro One in chunks because this strategy allows the province to maximize the value of the sale while still maintaining a controlling stake. His analysis yes, is spot on, Mr. Speaker. Um, I continue to look forward to working with this government to build infrastructure right across the province, okay. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, people want to build a good life for themselves, and what's more important, they want to build a better life for the next generation. They want to make sure that they have the same, if not better, than what they had. But the, but the rising cost of living makes that very difficult. Privatization of how, of on, how Ontario generates electricity has increased the cost of electricity from about four cents per kilowatt hour to 18 cents per kilowatt hour. That's what the privatization is doing. Now the Liberal government is opening up the privatization of Hydro One, and naturally, that's going to increase costs even further. And now they're opening up a further door of the privatization of local hydro utilities. Selling off more of our hydro system means less options, less opportunities. It means the next generation will have a difficult time and harder time instead of an easier time. Will the Premier make it clear and commit to ending any Question. further privatization of our public hydro utility system? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, we're on track uh, to realize the target of $9 billion generated through the IPO, Mr. Speaker. And through that, um, as, as I was you know, going to continue to talk about the, the report in the Globe and Mail, Mr. Speaker, broadening the ownership of Hydro One is smart policy, Mr. Speaker. It's supporting this government's significant investment in infrastructure right across the province and talking about creating jobs, Mr. Speaker. Part of the money that we're getting from, uh, from the broadening of this sale went towards $173 million that uh, might my friend from the Ministry of Transportation was able to announce, Mr. Speaker, on expanding Highway 69 to four lanes, Mr. Speaker, making our roads safer and making sure that we create hundreds of jobs throughout the province as we build Ontario up, Mr. Speaker. We've got investments happening from Kenora to Ottawa to Windsor, yes, all over this province, Mr. Speaker, because we recognize the importance of building infrastructure and broadening the sale of Hydro One just, does just that, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there's no broader ownership than every single person in this province owning their public utility. I don't understand how the government can kind of stand up and make this ludicrous suggestion. The people are worried that the Premier is getting ready to help privatize local utilities. People have seen this movie before. They've seen it with Hydro One. They've seen it with this government never running on this idea of selling off Hydro One and then going ahead and selling off our public utility. Now, we know that the Liberals haven't run on, they haven't spoken about this in their throne speech, they haven't run on the sale of private hydro, local hydro utilities, but now we're seeing that they're not ruling that out as well. Privatized hydro is pushing people over the edge. Will the Premier once and for all rule out any further privatization of our public utilities? Just rule it out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, again, thanks for the question. Um, you know, he started off his question talking about how it's important to make sure that every single Ontarian uh, owns a portion of uh, Ont uh, Hydro, Hydro One, and we'll continue to do that, Mr. Speaker. Ontario will remain the single largest shareholder of Hydro One. Legislation uh, requires that we keep a minimum of 40 percent ownership, so, and no other shareholder group is going to own more than 10 percent of that, Mr. Speaker. So, you know what? Every single Ontarian in this province is talking about what they want and what 
what they want to own. What about owning new transit? What about making sure we're building bridges, Mr. Speaker? What about owning decent roads right across the province, Mr. Speaker? That's what Ontarians want. They want jobs and growth, and we're providing that, Mr. Speaker. We're building Ontario up, and we'll continue with that focus and make sure it happens for all families right across this province. Thank you. The question the member from Leeds, uh, Thanks, uh, Speaker. My question is to the President of the Treasury Board. By law, this government is to table the province's public accounts by the end of this week. But on Tuesday, the President of the Treasury Board rose in the House and said, because of ongoing discussions with the Treasury Board and the Auditor General, the books would be delayed. But an insider says these, this discussion is more of a dispute and that the Treasury Board is challenging the Auditor General's accounting. Again. Mr. Speaker, will the President of the Treasury Board please explain why she will not be tabling the public accounts on time? Speaker, what is this government hiding? Well, thank you very much, Speaker. And let me uh, answer the last, last part of the question first. We're not hiding anything. In fact, if he reflected on the rest of my statement to the House, he would know that I had also said that I am pleased to report to the House that, in fact, we are on track to meet our deficit targets as published in last year's budget and the uh, fall, fall, uh, fall economic statement from a year ago. So we're not hiding anything. We are on track to meet our targets. What I did say, Speaker, was that we are having uh, there's some complex uh, accounting issues that uh, we're working on. We're working on them with the Auditor General. I have directed Answer. my officials at Treasury Board to uh, work with the Auditor General and to come up with a plan to uh, to uh, table the books as soon as possible. Uh, uh, back to the President of the Treasury Board. You know, Speaker, something just doesn't seem right. Just one week ago, the Deputy Minister at the Treasury Board quit. Now the Liberals are going to miss the tabling deadline. Yep. Why is that? Has this government been using shady accounting practices? Is the debt and deficit higher than the government is letting on? Mr. Speaker, what exactly is going on in that office? What else is this government trying to hide? I just uh, caution the member that uh, on the tightrope walk, it's close, and if it gets anything near again, I'll uh, ask the member to withdraw. President of Treasury. Yes, thank you very much. And I would repeat that we have absolutely nothing to hide. There is a discussion going on between uh, the accountants uh, in the Auditor General's office, the accountants in the Treasury Board Secretariat, the accountants at uh, the Ministry of Finance, and I've asked that uh, they come together. It's an accounting issue. It's quite a complex accounting issue, and that they come together and uh, find a solution to that, and that we will table the books as quickly as possible. But once again, I want to assure the members, Speaker, that we have absolutely nothing to hide, and that in fact we are on target to meet the deficit uh, plan that we uh, tabled in the budget in the fall economic statement. Thank you. Thank you. The member from Timiskimi, Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. People in rural and northern Ontario are being hammered by sky-high hydro delivery charges, which are often higher than the actual cost of the power consumed. Absolutely. The Wynn government has promised to reduce the rural delivery charges by 12 percent. In the House yesterday, the Premier stated that rural and northern communities have access to the 20 percent reduction, which is 12 plus the HST. My question is very simple. Will all northern and rural customers qualify for the promised 12 percent delivery charge reduction? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the honourable member for his question. As we said all along, families in rural and remote communities that have been qualifying for the Triple RP will continue to get the Triple RP. If the families don't have the Triple RP, they get the 8 percent, Mr. Speaker. So the one thing that we're very proud of is we're making sure that the Triple RP that has never increased is now going to $45 a month or 20 percent on an average bill, Mr. Speaker. We're making sure that the families that are in northern Ontario, that are in rural parts of our, our province, Mr. Speaker, can save as much as possible. It's difficult, Mr. Speaker, for me to, to actually have a broad sweep with, with all people because everyone has a different uh, designation on their bill, Mr. Speaker. The important thing to recognize is every family will be getting at least 8 percent right across the province, Mr. Speaker, and those families that are in northern parts or rural parts, Mr. Speaker, they will get the 20 percent. Thank you very much, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, my question is again to the Premier. This morning, in a response, she said there will be a 12 percent reduction for rural communities. She didn't say rural and remote. She said rural communities. The minister now says he's backtracking a bit because several times in this House it was 20 percent for everyone. So there's 1.8 million people in rural Ontario, but apparently only 300,000 will be getting the rebate. Wow. So the wow. full rebate. So people need to know. Will the Premier tell people who were promised but won't be getting it? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So now it's a debate among semantics. Rural, remote, northern, Mr. Speaker. I know the folks in northern Ontario don't like being called rural, but you know what, Mr. Speaker? Those last ones usually get you in trouble. Minister. Mr. Speaker, 330,000 families in the rural or remote or northern parts of our province will be getting the benefit of 20 percent on their bills. We've been saying this all along, Mr. Speaker, and we recognize even the financial accountability officer has come out with a report, Mr. Speaker, that says we recognize that some families in these parts of our province are seeing a higher cost of their electricity bill on the delivery charge. That percentage, Mr. Speaker, that goes directly towards lowering that piece. But the Financial Accountability Answer. Officer also said, Mr. Speaker, that on average we're right in the middle of the pack when it comes to our rates right across this country, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. No question. The member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Education. We have a lot to be proud of when it comes to student achievement, thanks in large part to our great educators and staff. Our schools are recognized across the country and around the world for excellence in education, and this is something that we need to be extremely proud of. Last week, I understand you announced how we are working together with our schools to implement our new renewed math strategy. And I know that the latest EQAO results show that there is more work for us to do to support our students and our teachers in mathematics learning. Speaker, through you to the minister, what is the Ontario government doing to raise student achievement in mathematics? Thank you, Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to say thank you to the very hardworking member from Kingston and the Islands, and I know that she is a wonderful advocate for her constituents. Mr. Speaker, supporting effective learning and teaching in mathematics is a top priority for our government. I am very proud that we are dedicating more than $60 million to supporting students across the province as they strive to do well in mathematics. And this strategy is in place as of September. Math is critical to the jobs of today and to the jobs of the future. Our renewed math strategy is informed by research and best practices in learning, and we have consulted with educators from across the sector. It focuses on the need of students, educators, and parents while encouraging a shared responsibility that we all yes, share to support our students in their learning. By working together with our students, we can ensure their success. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you, Minister. We are extremely proud of the investments made in education. It is important that we will continue to focus on improving the achievement of all students in mathematics. And I'm pleased to hear that the students in my riding of Kingston and the Islands and boards like the Limestone District School Board, the Algonquin Lakeshore Catholic School Board, A des Ecoles Publiques Francophones, will have access to increased support when it comes to mathematics. Minister, can you please tell this House what types of supports and opportunities our government will be providing as part of the renewed math strategy? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member. Mr. Speaker, since the beginning of the school year, we are introducing key elements of the renewed math strategy. A minimum of 60 minutes each day of protected time for learning effective math instruction, assessment for students in grades 1 to 8. Up to three math leads in all elementary schools. We're also ensuring that resources are in place for students and parents, better access to online math resources and math supports such as Homework Health and SOS DeWa, as well as a parent toolkit. Opportunities for educators to deepen their knowledge in math learning, teaching and leading. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank all of our education workers for the great work they're doing on behalf of our students. Best education. New question, the member from Nipissing. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. In his uh, recent annual report, the Financial Accountability Officer confirmed what we already know. This government is neither open nor transparent. The FAO said they are actively skirting their obligations and refusing to disclose information obligated under the law. He even said, quote, I believe this is political direction. Through the work of the FAO, we have learned a number of shocking revelations. The sale of Hydro One will have a negative impact on the province's finances. Business investment is set to decline, and Ontario's debt level is spiraling out of control. Yet they refuse to cooperate with the FAO and obey the law. I asked the minister, what are you hiding Question. from the Ontario taxpayers? Uh, Mr. Speaker, we're working very closely with the FAO. We recognize the importance of getting our information out. CD Howe Institute and many others have already expressed that uh, Ontario's books and accounting are by far the most transparent and most uh, 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 indicative of what is the state of affairs, unlike what would happen in the past during the Conservative regime where they hid five billion dollars at the time of their last election we have been surpassing our targets we have constantly decreased our deficits year over year uh, rating agencies and investors value ontario and uh, even the feo has recognized that we are coming to balance mr speaker thank you so much thank you supplementary thank you back to the minister well here are some examples of what the fao has called a quote broader pattern of secrecy and refusal to provide legally required information. Speaker, this government has failed to release the long-range assessment of Ontario's finances, which was due us on the June 12 deadline. They have failed to provide third-quarter financial statements since 2012. Speaker. These are important documents for MPPs to do our jobs, and yet they're and speaker, they're required under the Financial or Fiscal Transparency and Accountability Act. So much for being open and transparent. Speaker, this government has plunged Ontario into structural deficits and record levels of debt, yet they refuse to come clean and obey the law. I ask the minister again, what else are you hiding from the people of Ontario? Uh, Mr. Speaker, the long-term report is coming out as it did uh, four years ago, and uh, it actually did come out at a later time. And we're going to maintain. We want to make certain all the information is obtained, including some of our more recent reports that we are in the midst of having completed. Uh, but furthermore, Mr. Speaker, uh, the FAO recognizes credit agencies' assessment that we are well positioned to achieve our balanced target, stating, and I quote: "The credit agencies' affirmation of Ontario's credit rating indicates that they believe the province has taken adequate steps on both revenue." 
using expenditures to achieve its plan to restore balance, Mr. Speaker. The credibility of our plan was affirmed recently by four credit rating agencies, agencies including Moody's upgrading of their outlook on Ontario's credit. The FAO, the accountants, they're all working on a matter. We are eager to release our public uh, accounts because we have a great story to tell, a story to tell that included no support from the opposition to reduce our deficit and increase our Thank you. It's never too late. The member from Nipissing is warned. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. The government insists that the Ontario Energy Board will defend ratepayers when a privatized Hydro One comes calling to demand more private profits. But the Auditor General found that the OEB approved rate increases for capital upgrades that never took place. Hydro One spent the money on something else. And then, as the number of blackouts increased, Hydro One came back to demand even more ratepayer cash to fix the problems they should have fixed with the money they had already been given. What are the consequences for a utility that receives ratepayer cash for upgrades that never take place, or for the regulator that approves of rate increases? Good question. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm, uh, you know, thankful to be able to stand and and clarify a lot of things that uh, was in that question, Mr. Speaker, because you know Hydro One does not reflect investments in rates until those assess assets are in service, Mr. Speaker. So to make that clear, customers do not pay for deferred investments, and the OEB is very clear on that, Mr. Speaker. The OEB, as we've said all along, is the organization that sets the rates. They look at what uh, is being brought forward, and then they make that decision. At no time has any, any um, uh, decision been made to defer investments, Mr. Speaker. But what I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, that the hard work of this utility is part of what has transformed an unreliable and undermaintained uh, system that was left in place by the PCs, Mr. Speaker. And we've turned that into a clean system, a reliable system Answer. that we have today, Mr. Speaker, and that's something that we can all be proud of, Mr. Speaker. Well, Speaker, it's clear that the government hasn't read the Auditor General's report on Hydro One. The Ontario Energy Board approved higher delivery rates to pay for a five-fold increase in capital spending by Toronto Hydro, but upgrades that were supposed to take place years ago were delayed or deferred. Even though the OEB gave them ratepayer money for capital upgrades, the CEO of Toronto Hydro and the Mayor of Toronto are now claiming there is no other way to pay for up capital upgrades and prevent blackouts except through privatization. Wow. And the Premier is encouraging this privatization by offering a fat tax break that will transfer a debt burden onto Ontarians. Instead of subsidizing the privatization of Toronto Hydro, why won't the Premier make sure that when the OEB approves rate increases for capital upgrades, that those upgrades actually take place. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, please. You see it, please. Minister. Again, Mr. Speaker, when it, when it comes to the privatizing of Toronto Hydro, Mr. Speaker, that's a decision for Toronto City Council. When it comes to the OEB, Mr. Speaker, the agency has a strong record of reviewing rate applications with the consumer in mind, Mr. Speaker. For example, in 2010, Hydro One asked for a rate increase for its distribution and received a 9 percent reduction uh, in its capital request. In 2012, Hydro One asked for a rate increase for its transmission and received a 3 percent reduction for its capital request, Mr. Speaker. Priority when it comes to replacing transformers, Mr. Speaker, is decided by the condition, performance, and how critical the asset is into the electricity service is one of the factors that they look at when they're making that decision as a company, Mr. Speaker. And once again, there is nothing there to reflect that investments in rates uh, um, will increase uh, for assets that are in service. Answer. Customers do not pay, Mr. Speaker, for deferred investments. Thank you. New question, the member from Northumberland, uh, Cookie West. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question for the Minister of Infrastructure. Minister, Ontarians know that investing in infrastructure creates jobs, stimulates growth, and enhances the quality of life is a top priority for our government. Absolutely. Our historic $160 billion investment 
has already started building bridges, roads, schools, hospitals, and other critical public infrastructure projects in my riding and across the province. This investment will also fund often forgotten but equally important green infrastructure projects, such as clean water and wastewater infrastructure. Across Ontario, there is a growing need for all levels of government to make strategic investment in clean water, effective water management system. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, could he please explain to the South the investment our government is making in clean water and wastewater infrastructure? Thank you, Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to thank the uh, member from the Great Riding of uh, Northumberland, Quinty West. Uh, Speaker, the people of Ontario deserve to know that they have clean water and effective water management systems that they can trust each and every day. That is why our government is partnering with the federal government to make significant investments in clean water and wastewater infrastructure across the province. Good idea. The federal and provincial governments, along with Ontario's municipalities, are investing $1.1 billion in the Clean Water and Wastewater Fund, Speaker, which will provide access to clean and reliable drinking water, efficient wastewater systems, and healthy waterways. $270 million will be provided by our government and Ontario's uh, municipalities each. Speaker, we are honouring our commitment to build Ontario up by investing in critical public infrastructure Answer. that creates jobs, stimulates growth, and enhances quality of life. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Minister. I'm delighted to know that our government is making significant investments into the protection of municipal water supply. It is encouraged to know that our government is working to ensure constituents like mine from Port Hope to Quinty West have safe, reliable public infrastructure that they can count on. I know that our government's multi-billion dollar investment in infrastructure will create jobs, stimulate growth, and enhance quality of life for all Ontarians, sustaining an average of 110,000 jobs per year. I also know that our government offers many infrastructure funding programs for everything from small community projects to major public transit works. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, could you please elaborate on our government historic infrastructure programs? Question. Thank you, Minister. Uh, 41 projects uh, have already been approved under the Clean Water and Wastewater Fund, and applications from all municipalities and First Nations across the province are now being accepted. But the fund is only one part of our province's historic $160 billion investment in critical public infrastructure. The constituency, the constituency of every single member in this House will receive support for infrastructure projects through various funds. We have committed to boosting the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund from $100 million to $300 million per year, and are spending $31 billion on moving Ontario forward, $15 billion of which will be spent outside the GTHA and many of the ridings of the members opposite speaker. We have also committed $1 billion to the Ring of Fire Answer. in Northern Ontario and billions more in education and health care capital and retrofits. Thank you. The question, the member from York Simple. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, when the ORPP was abandoned, the government said it would cost around $20 million. Then it was revealed the true cost was more than $70 million, including generous severances for Liberal friends, some of whom had only worked on the ORPP for days. But that report also revealed an unaccounted $12 million in office space. First it was 20, then 70, now 82. Will the Premier tell us the true cost of cancelling the ORPP? Or are you hiding that? Ah. Mr. Speaker, the Minister, I know the Minister of Finance will want to comment in the supplementary, but let me just say, Mr. Speaker, that uh, it is a very good thing that across this country we now have agreement on Canada Country Plan and Mr. Speaker. And the fact is that we were moving ahead to put in place an Ontario Retirement Pension Plan in the absence, because under the Stephen Harper government, and I know that the Leader of the Opposition knows all about that, under the, under the Stephen Harper government, there was no appetite for, no understanding of the pension crisis that was facing people across the country. So now that we have been able to work with the federal government and work with our colleagues across the country, we have a Canada Pension Plan enhancement, Mr. Speaker, but we were very determined in Ontario to make 
make sure that in the absence of that agreement at the federal level and across the country, we would have secure retirement for people Answer. in Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again to the Premier. If the Premier had just listened to my call to put an end to the ORPP yep. while on hold, on hold after the federal election. Order. The member from Durham is warned. Finish, please. Thank you. Um, instead, the Liberals recklessly plowed ahead. The $82 million doesn't count staff resources or the $7 million spent every year on pension policy development. Mr. Speaker, the Premier should come clean and tell us the true cost of, ca of cancelling the ORPP. And I want to ask another part of a question here. Do Ontario taxpayers regularly pay for cross-country advertising? Oh. Yeah. Mr. Finance. Mr. Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, a couple of things uh, that the member references which are completely incorrect. But the most important one is the fact that if we had listened to them and listened to her, there would be no retirement security for the people of Ontario or the people of Canada. There would be no CPP. We stood in this house, we fought for the people of Ontario and all of Canada. And I'm very proud of the work that this Premier has done to support that cause. And furthermore, we put forward what we anticipate will be the high point of any outstanding cost. And those costs are actually coming down, Mr. Speaker. So again, she's incorrect on that point. And furthermore, this is a national effective situation that we're benefiting all of Canada, and that is what this member doesn't feel, doesn't recognize. We are working for all of Canada as well as Ontario, and they're going to benefit from the decisions that all of us are making collectively, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? A couple of people in different seats again that I may have to come back to who continue to uh, do those things that they're not supposed to do. Good question. Member from Hamilton, East Stony Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. 900,000 people depend on Ontario Works and ODSP to live. Since 1995, the price of a loaf of bread or a dozen eggs has more than doubled. Rent and hydro have gone through the roof. In that time, social assistance for a single person has gone up just $18. That's barely 2% in 21 years. Families can't make ends meet. Kids are going hungry. Your announcement today won't even dent the years of neglect. Why has this government not used its 13 years in power to substantially increase the efforts for the people and the, the money they need Question. to survive? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the minister responsible for poverty reduction um, will want to comment in the, uh, the supplementary. But I want to I want to just say to the uh, to the member opposite that you know I completely support in principle uh, the uh, the bill that he's brought forward. And Mr. Speaker, we have already taken action to uh, to put more money in the hands of people who are uh, who are vulnerable in this province. And the fact is, the group that was uh, most at risk. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the single people without children now receive $100 per month more um, than, uh, than they did in 2012, and that's $1,200 uh, a year more than, uh, than they received. Mr. Speaker, we've increased uh, $25 a month for single adults receiving Ontario Works, 1.5% for families receiving Ontario Works, and 1.5% for individuals with Answer. disabilities who receive ODSP. Mr. Speaker, on, on top of that, the Ontario Child Benefit. We're working on uh, rent supplements. We understand that there are a myriad things that we need Thank to you. do to support people who are living in poverty. Mr. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Thank you, the Premier, for the compliment. However, uh, even with your increase, uh, people are still $11,500 below the poverty level. This government is failing the most vulnerable people in Ontario. People expected more from the Premier and her government. This government simply does not understand the cost of living in our province. Do Democrats believe 
The government should make policy based on evidence and research. We need hard evidence on the real cost of living to ensure that social assistance benefits meet their basic needs. In April, all three parties, I quote, voted to support the establishment of a social assistant research commission, which we appreciate. But we don't want it to die at committee. We want it to go through committee, be called to committee, go for third reading, and be law in this province. Will the Premier Question. and her caucus support the Social Assistance Research Commission again, as they did unanimously last five months ago this afternoon, and Thank ensure you. that the committee call this bill? Thank you. Thank you. Premier. Minister Responsible for Poverty Reduction. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm uh, delighted to uh, respond to the uh, question from the member opposite. And uh, I wish I had more time to go over a, an exceptionally lengthy list of all the positive accomplishments that this government has accomplished in the past uh, three years. I just want to touch on a couple. The, the, the Income Security Reform Working Group is developing that roadmap that focuses on needs and prioritizes actions for the most meaningful impact. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I just want to touch on a couple of things that are happening. For example, we've removed the provincial clawback on child support payments to families receiving social assistance, increasing the annual income of almost 19,000 families by an average of $282 per month. That's $3,300 annually. Most of these are single-income families, Mr. Answer. Speaker. This government is dedicated to working with the most vulnerable members of our society, Mr. Speaker, and making sure they reach their potential. Thank you. Any questions? The member from Scarborough Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the President of Treasury Board Secretariat. Minister, it is well known to every member in this House that the Treasury Board Secretary acts as an important control function for the government, that the Treasury Board is responsible for ensuring that we maximize. Stop. No, sorry. Uh, continue the clock. The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek uh, is warned. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That the Treasury Board is responsible for ensuring that we maximize the value of every dollar that we spend. In addition to control costs, your ministry is proactively working to modernize government and fund efficiencies. The minister is leading our government in streamlining transfer payments to the organizations that deliver services and are implementing more effective ways of delivering information, information technology solution to Ontarians. As a part of modernizing government, I know that the Treasury Board support ministry by adding behavioral science lenses to policy development and program implementations. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, Question. can she inform the House how Treasury Board support ministry through the Behavioral Insights Unit? Thank right. you. Thank you. President of Treasury Board. Yes, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Scarborough Agent and Court for her excellent question. Ontario is one of the first jurisdictions in Canada to leverage behavioral sciences to improve outcomes and deliver better services to Ontarians. And a really good example of this speaker is the organ donor registration. We know the majority of Ontarians say they are willing to register as an organ and tissue donor, yet only 27 per cent are registered. The Greater Toronto Area has one of the lowest rates in the province, with only 17 per cent registry. Using behavioural insights, Treasury Board worked closely with the Ministry of Health to improve the registration process, making it easier and faster for donors to register while making it cost-effective for the Ministry of Health. With this new process, we saw registration rates increase up to 143 per cent. Thank you. Great news. Supplementary. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the response. I know the Treasury Board is often characterized by the financial function it performs for the rest of the government. It is great to hear that the Treasury Board is assisting Ministry in creating more efficient processes and delivering positive outside outcomes. In my writing on Scarborough Asian Court, I encourage my constituents to become registered organ and tissue donors. I also work closely with Mohan, Tom, and Helen, I know they're watching today, at the Scarborough Gift of Life Association to promote organ and 
and tissue donation in our diverse community. It is shocking, Mr. Speaker, to, for me to hear that only 17 per cent of GTA residents have registered as organ donors. I'm very pleased to hear that the Treasury Board is a part of that solution. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can she inform the House what other accomplishments that the Behavioral Insights Units of the Treasury Board have achieved to date? Thank you. Minister. Yes, thank you, Speaker. The Treasury Board created the Behavioral Insights Unit in 2013, Speaker, and we have numerous examples. For example, Treasury Board worked closely with the Ministry of Transportation yes, here, to here. modify the information sent to Ontarians, encouraging them to renew their license plate stickers, something that people don't really like doing all that much. They can do it online. Here, here. So during an eight-week pilot, uh, we saw more than 13,000 license plate renewals online with the help of the Behavioral Science uh, Unit, and that resulted in a saving of 28,000 because I think that's fine. Uh, because of the uh, because of that, in a short period of time, we saw large savings simply Answer. by shifting user behavior. So, uh, with with the help of the recent behavioral insight unit, we Thank look you. forward to more of these. Pro Thank you. Your question, the member for Whitby Oslo. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is uh, for the Premier. Premier, in 2010, Jim McEwen, a Durham Region resident, suffered a stroke at the age of 55. Like many post-stroke patients, Mr. McEwen has required hundreds of physiotherapy treatments to regain mobility and improve his quality of life. However, when Mr. McEwen needed our health care system the most, he was afforded only a dozen treatments and then was forgotten about. In fact, the OHIP model for physiotherapy greatly limits the coverage of those between the ages of 20 and 64. As a result, Speaker, post-stroke patients in this age range struggle for access to rehabilitation services they need and deserve. Premier, will you take steps to ensure that all post-stroke patients, regardless of age, have access to sufficient rehabilitation Question. services? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to begin Social by Minister thanking the member opposite for the question and his advocacy. And I want to reassure him that indeed p uh, um, patients under the age of 65 who are recovering from a stroke are eligible for OHIP covered restorative services. Our government is committed to providing quality care to all stroke patients, and as part of the Patients First Action Plan, we're already taking steps to improve the quality of care provided to Ontarians for post stroke care. Let me give you some examples. In Ontario, publicly funded physiotherapy and other rehabilitation services regardless of the age of the patient, is available for anybody who is recovering from post-acute stroke recovery either, and is offered in five settings, hospitals, hospital outpatient clinics, in-home care, long-term care homes, and community Answer. physio clinics. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Premier Speaker. There's a large body of evidence indicating that with consistent rehabilitation post-stroke patients can show dramatic improvements to their health. We need to recognize that there's a great need for comprehensive and integrated post-stroke management. Premier, this afternoon I'm bringing forward a private member's bill for second reading, asking to end age discrimination for post-stroke recovery patients. Will you commit, Premier, to supporting that bill? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I thank the member opposite for his advocacy. I also thank him for introducing his private member's bill. You know, I look forward to the debate on this bill, as I know does the Minister of Health. We look forward to hearing all of the arguments. We look forward to hearing the legislature discuss the bill and let it uh, you know, go through its due course. But in the meantime, I want to reiterate, Mr. Speaker, that this government already has uh, programs in place to help uh, post-stroke recovery victims, rec uh, patients, regardless of their age. So, Mr. Speaker, we are already doing that. We always look forward to doing more. So, Mr. Speaker, all I wanted to say is I know that the Minister of Health, when he is back, will also want to weigh in on this, and I want to assure this legislature of our commitment to helping uh, patients recovering from stroke with all of the services that they absolutely need and deserve. That is what our universal health care is all about, Mr. 
to speak. New question, the member from London West. Uh, Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, seniors in London have been waiting months on end for complex continuing care beds. More than two years ago, there was a plan to add 11 beds in London, but it never happened. This Liberal government has made no new funding commitment to complex continuing care, which leaves Londoners unable to access the care that they need. Speaker, we are at a tipping point in my community. Without some big changes soon, London hospitals will not be able to meet the growing needs of Londoners. Instead of cutting hospital budgets, when will the Premier support the new complex continuing care beds that our hospitals and our patients need? Question. Thank you. Premier. Responsible for seniors affairs. Sir, responsible for seniors affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As uh, uh, I used to be, as you know, the Associate Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, well, um, responsible for long-term care. And so I just want to assure this House that indeed uh. our government has been making record investments in long-term care. As the Minister responsible for seniors, I will continue to advocate on behalf of seniors. But I do want to remind this Legislature that we have increased funding for long-term care at record levels. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Point of order, the member from Scarborough Agent Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to welcome my Scarborough residents who is here for MS Lobby Day, Barbara Dixon, also the author of Bomb Girl. Welcome to Queen's Park, Barbara. We have a deferred vote on the motion of second reading of Bill 13, an act to respect the cost of electricity. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
members, please take your seats. All members, please take your seats. On September 21, 2016, Mr. Thibault moved that a second reading of Bill 13, an act in respect of the cost of electricity. All those in favour, please rise one at a time, be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Thibault. Mr. Thibault. Mr. Mr. Nackney. Mr. Nackney. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sandal. Mr. Sandal. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardnetti. Mr. Bardnetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Couteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Codry. Padre. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Domerlo. Ms. Domerlo. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Naidu Harris. Mrs. Naidu Harris. Mrs. Wong. Mrs. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Don. Mr. Don. Mrs. Hogarth. Mrs. Hogarth. Mrs. Koala. Mrs. Koala. Mrs. Molly. Mrs. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Vernil. Mr. Vernil. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoker. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoker. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Marteau. Mr. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Tabby. Mr. Tabby. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Vancock. Mr. Vancock. Mr. Denova. Mr. Denova. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Sapp. Mr. Sapp. Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong. Madame Jellinek. Madame Jellinek. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gretzky. Mr. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Ms. The ayes being 84 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill, deuxième lecture du projet de loi. Pursuant to the order of the House dated September the 28th, 2016, the bill is ordered referred to the Standing Committee on Justice Policy. There being no further the point of order, the member from Eglinton Lawrence. Just want to remind uh, all members, there's a very important uh, reception by the MS Society, and everybody's welcome and bring your carnation. Thank you. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.